empowered by the Holy Spirit. The mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is the voice of the beloved. Our scripture reading is Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. And it reads, the voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping up on the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Our scripture is from the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs or the can uh, Canical of Canicles. It can be read as erotic love poems, or it can be allegorically read. Our passage teaches us about the various kinds of love, the excitement of the love between two young people, the maturity and mutuality of love, the love of God for God's people, and what love in the presence of God for all eternity may be like. In West Side Story, Tony and Maria, lovers as young and sentimental as the lovers in our passage sing, tonight, tonight, I'll see my love tonight. That's not a bad gross uh, of, our, of our text. Of course, that doesn't mean that anything goes or that all of the appropriate virtues of commitment, exclusivity, and stability are not important. The Song of Solomon conveys the voice of a young shepherd woman, deeply in love, whose senses are vibrantly tuned to every aspect of her beloved and of her natural surroundings and who reports a lengthy and sensual poem of longing that her beloved has conveyed to her. The woman is speaking, recounting her lover's words as he urges her into the springtime. The lover's voice attracts the woman's attention and then she sees him first from a distance and then suddenly very close close enough now to call her with tender intimacy. The en energy of his running continues as he looks through the windows. His eagerness is irrepressible and his gazelle-like leaping portrays not only strength and vigor, but sexual energy. The thrill of self forget full driving desire. That desire now inhabits his eyes, his gaze thrusting through the lattice into the house. The wall of the building has brought him to a halt and now he must persuade and entice. 
the power shifts to the woman. She must decide to come out into the blooming fertile world. Perhaps behind this image is the practice found elsewhere in the ancient Near East of keeping the bridegroom waiting while the bride perfects her beauty and her apparel. This waiting is important because it shifts the balance between the lovers. His reduction to eager looking, to standing outside, intensifies the worth of his beloved. Waiting honors love. He invites her to join him outside. Now that the rain has stopped and the clouds have thinned to shreds and life is rising from the winter defeats, she belongs here in all this luxuriant countryside. For him, she crowns it with her beauty and in embracing him, makes him a home with turtle doves and flowers in a fruitful earth. After the heavy rains of early spring, the Palestinian fields are thick with flowers, commanding the ground with color, opening with a suddenness that the poet has previously associated with the lover and his rush across the hills. The vines are in bloom and they give forth fragrance. The poet appeals repeatedly to our senses, shifting from hearing to sight as the lover is heard and then looked for to hearing again. And when the lover pleads with the woman and then back to sight and hearing to gather in the flow of the flowers opening and the singing of the birds, we can almost taste the figs and smell the enticement of fragrance of spring. He concludes repeating his plea, arise my love, my fair one and come away. The sensuality of all of this helps us know that our sexuality is a gift from our creator. At the very least, the presence of this poetry in scripture reminds us that sexual love with its delights is not a secular event, but an expression of the divine love and longing that brought all of us into being. It is a reflection of the harmony God seeks for us and for all. Second, our scripture teaches us, us about the mutuality of love. The miraculous stag gazes in at the window. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Is he asking her to leave country, city, or family to establish a lineage and fulfill a promise? Is he expecting subordination? What we hear in this passage is he actually says, for now the winter is past and the rain is over. You see, he's inviting her to join in an unthreatening, flowering, singing landscape, fruitfully fit for love. Often in this song, she asks the same of him and pursues his affectionately. Their songs can be heard without strain as an allegory for the mutuality of love. Why mutuality? It may be because the idea of love generates a sense of mutuality that becomes part of the logic of love. Love so desires its return that love almost is in this desire. And when it foregoes this desire, 
when it cares and delights in the other, forgetting anything in return, it seems that it transcends itself. The ultimate logic of love is self-surpassing. The song explores love becoming extravagant toward another. So when we associate it with God's love for Israel or the church or the soul, we're not far off. The logic of self-surpassing love has a beginning in these songs of mutual, erotic, friendly, familial, aesthetic desire. Come to my garden, my sister, my bride, eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Where is this garden? And hence arises the logic of love. Literally, the lovers enjoy their bodies as gardens in sexual relationships and in friendship. Ethically, they beckon each other into a garden of mutuality where they will gaze, listen, and grow without subordination. Theologically, they go into the garden of creation, suggested by the lushness around them, where divine love is creating the logic of love. Eschatologically, are they not singing that love is strong as death, leaping along a biblical arc of meaning where love has the last word and the first? Third, this scripture teaches about God's love for God's people, recounting God's love for Israel and the history of their relationship. Both Jewish and Christians, readers, read the poetry theologically, viewing the ecstasy between the man and the woman in the setting of the natural world as reversing the alienation among the first couple, Adam and Eve, and God and their garden of the earth. The imagery conveys the quickening of the earth uh, and of the heart. Following the winter's dormancy, the earth smells uh, that rise as the soil warms, vegetation shoots up and blossoms, and the birds once again sing and find a day worth singing about. All the earth does what it is made by its creator to do. Turtle doves coo, fig trees fruit, vines flower fragrantly, and humans love and delight. In this garden, unlike Eden so long ago, the natural world, including its human population, responds harmoniously to the prompting of the seasons, as we were all made to do. Nothing is amiss, nothing is askewed, all things work together for good, and all are blessed together. Young love awakens, fertile and ripe and expectant, as perfectly tuned to its surrounding as bees to the nectar they seek filled with possibilities and delight. Isaiah compares God's love for Israel to a lover growing a vineyard for the beloved. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard, Isaiah 5.1. In the book of Proverbs, Lady Wisdom comes to woo faithful followers with language that is inescapably romantic. The whole poem reflects the frustration of desertion. Wisdom cries out in the street, in the square, she raises her voice. 
because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hands and no one heeded. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you. Proverbs 1, 20, 24, and 26. When Jesus calls out in Matthew 11 for folks to come to him, he is, of course, the wise teacher and thoughtful Messiah we respect so much but he is also a reflection of Lady Wisdom standing on the street corner, calling out with longing, looking for love. Maybe he's even a reflection of the lover who longs for by the woman in today's song. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping up on the mountains, bounding over the hills. Jesus. My beloved speaks to me and says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Marvin Pope's commentary on the Song of Songs is filled to the brim with commentary on this passage, as well as all of the book commentary that all allegorizes the love poetry as loving communion between Israel or the church and God. While much of Christian teaching and preaching are in terms of task and calling and even arduous suffering, such are not the ends in themselves. The greatest gift of all is the gift of Sabbath, in which Israel was commanded to rest and savor all the delights of divine bounty, including the gifts of food, of family, and of mutual love. Last of all, the passage tells us of what it will be like to be in the presence of God for eternity. Christians have long distinguished between the literal and the spiritual meaning of scripture. The spiritual meaning was far further divided into the allegorical, which dealt with the doctrine of the passage. The, cop, uh, the topographical, which shows us how we are to live. And the anagorical, which reveals our final home. The anagorical then interprets scripture in terms of the last things, and in particular, opening up visions of heaven, our eternal home in God. The Song of Solomon invites such an allegorical reading. Christ runs toward us with the eagerness of God, as eager as a lover long departed by darkness and hard rain. Christ invites us. He does not command us. He does not seize us. He entices us by loving persuasion. He shall raise us into God's new creation, which is brimming over with life, budding, growing, singing, and chattering ridiculously. Jesus declares the peace of God and everything is fruitful. Within this glory, he calls us as if we were fair and unblemished because in his mercy, we are just that and lifts us into an eternal fragrance, a joyous offering to the father. All its fertile all is fertile again and shall be always in this spring without a winter. Whatever heaven is like, it will not be less than the sensual wonder of this song, nor will it simply be different. It will be that wonder only flowing over 
unconstrained, fulfilled in the excesses of infinite love. Thanks be unto God. My brothers and sisters, believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. By confessing faith in Christ and being baptized into his church, we become children of God. Through faith and baptism, we receive life in the spirit. We invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh, loving and kind God, thank you for the love and the sexuality that you have given us in faithful, loving relationships. Thank you for the love of family. Thank you for the love of spouse. Thank you for the love of friend. Thank you for the love of brothers and sisters in the fellowship of faith. Lord, we know each one of those are different, but we know that each of them is a gift from you. And it allows us not only to be children of faith, but people who experience your unending love and mercy and therefore can share it with one another. We thank you, Lord, for opportunities for mission and ministry. We thank you for opportunities to use the gifts of your spirit in order to bless others, to be kind to one another, to speak words of encouragement and truth. Lord, we ask that you just continue to fill us with your love. Replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with your healing and wholeness. Replace our sadness, our grief, our anxiety with your joy your peace, your hope, and your love. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Christ and our King. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen. <music>